Hey, you're very welcome to the Michael Harding podcast. Welcome, especially if you're new and if you're used to me, you're used to Friday evenings or Saturday mornings being a time where I try and share my story as a storyteller. And part of sharing that story, which I don't do anywhere else, I don't do this in in newspaper columns, I don't do it in books. What I do in the podcast is I share at a deep and personal level my religious faith. And my religious faith is something that is like trying to activate the heart, awakening the heart. And I can sometimes find myself breathing in terms of Buddhist prayer or Muslim prayer or Christian prayer or Jewish prayer, whatever. And I see them like uh, Muhammad, may his name be praised, saw prayer or saw religions. He said they were all like different tea. Religions were like different tea, but they all needed hot water. And that hot water is like the open heart or the deepening, awakening heart. And you know what the awakening heart is in yourself whether you're religious or not. It's it's like it is the heart of you. It is the loving, loving heart of you. It exists and breeds and lives without any religion. It's just part of who we are as human beings. But it is the part that you activate if, if you do choose to use religion. And I, I use the phrase to use religion because, again, It's not that we are possessed or are slaves of religion. We use religion to get ourselves to a place of peace. So, in a sense, it's a kind of psychotherapy, just like you might do meditation or you might do all sorts of exercises that would bring you to a place of of repose and calm in your mind so you can use religion in the same way. If there is a difference... It is that sometimes meditation can get stuck in the brain, in the mind, in the sense of the the conscious mind. Whereas in prayer you let the conscious mind fall down into the heart and you begin to develop a disposition of love and affection for the people around you, the sentient beings around you, the trees and the cosmos around you, and for yourself. So that's why I use religion. I think it is a truly magnificent psychotherapy, a healing dimension in all the lovely gifts of learning and language we have. Religion is this extraordinary tradition that's handed down to us. And I find that your my objections to religion, my difficulties with institutions, they all fall away when I do the one single thing that all religions do, and that is prayer. And prayer, again, it's the same no matter what the religion. The disposition of prayer is turning. They used to say raising the mind and heart to God. A better way of putting it, I think, is that that you turn the heart towards the mentor deity in the second person singular. You begin to speak some word. You use you use prayers that you, you know, find in a book, and you. You use the second person singular, you're, you're, you're talking to you, you know, as if there was another person in the room, and you're speaking these words. And I personally believe that prayer is not working at the beginning just in your head. It's, it's not sufficient. You know, you could be driving the car, and you're, in your head there's a conscious bit of your mind saying, oh, Jesus, I hope I don't crash. It's not really prayer. Prayer needs some kind of embodiment. It needs to be acted out. It needs to be physicalized. And that's why, for me, the icons of the Orthodox tradition are so rich and so sensible because they're so like physical choreography. It's like prayer in Orthodoxy. It's like choreography. It's like movements, prostrations, bowing, lighting candles. Well, add to that words you say, prayers you say, whether they're Buddhist prayers, pujas as they call them in 
Tibetan Buddhism, you know, evening prayers or offerings. And, and you, you say things, you create a little ritual and you say a prayer different times of the day or at a regular time of the day. And, and this really begins to open your heart in a deep and wide way. You begin to find that that there is this room in the heart, this space within you that is like foundational. It's what some great writers talk about as the hypostasis in the image of Christ. You know, that there is this substance, this substance at the at the core of you that is like Christ. You are Christ. You are God made man. You are. And that's the substantial awakening of the heart. And it's awakening yourself to the cosmic world around you in all its relationality. In other words, that that you're not just in the cosmos, but you are the cosmos. And the cosmos is not just a mechanical universe, but it's a it's an organic, living, conscious singularity. You you could describe it in poetic terms as the womb of Mary the womb of God. And that would be poetic, but when you begin to pray, you begin to believe in the power of that poetic, that that the poetic world or the imaginal world, the realm of where we feel there's a deep resonating truth, an archetypal reality buried beneath the surface of a single idea or image, you, be, you begin to believe in this imaginal realm. And this is the realm of God. This is the realm of glory. This is the realm of angelic light. This is the realm of eternity. Because you're now using poetic language to describe something which is utterly and completely outside our physical universe, our spatial universe, our universe of matter, and our universe of time. So time and space and matter... All these things are a cage. And if we ever talk about God and think we have an idea of what God is, we're actually thinking about God within that cage. But of course, what the word God means in every religion is that which is actually outside the cage. What what is outside reality? It's as if to say God God doesn't exist. Because if all that exists is in the cosmos, then we're saying that there's a dimension beyond existence that upholds existence. It's a kind of a depth or dimension to it, an imaginal realm where things are even more deeply true. Okay, we'll not go too too complicated in that. Just hold on to the idea of opening the heart fully, hugely, wonderfully. How do you do that? Try prayer. What does that do for you? The same as other psychotherapy. It may help you live joyfully from one day to the next, not with a dystopian view, not with a a sense of terrible, morbid anxiety that, you know, the whole cosmos is beginning to collapse and burn up and it's all terrible and we're at fault and we're guilty. It, it allows you to live at a, a level deeper than that neurosis. And if there are anxieties in your life, worries in your life, whether you're a teenager or an old person or somewhere in between, prayer is this amazing language of poetry that creates within you an imaginal realm. It creates within you a form. It, it's, it's like the imprint of Christ as a sort of mystical kind of presence gets gets into your heart and reshapes it, remakes it in, in the image of Christ. And then you go around the world and you're saying, like St. Patrick, Christ before me, Christ behind me. Christ. Why? Because it's not that there's a whole lot of Christs floating around you. It's that the trees and the leaves and the birds and the the cat and the dog and the fish and the lake and the mount, everything is itself Christ. Everything is itself tingling with this frozen light, if you like. It's coming into being. 
as evolution continues, this, this journey through time in some way has been the journey of Christ being made present by the Godhead. I, I wanted to get into some of this this week. And I wanted to say that I will try and get into more of this in the next few weeks because next Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And I want to do it because I want to share with you really my enthusiasm for this sense of faith. I think that it's it's so valuable, no matter what age you are, you know, man or woman, boy or girl, whatever, married, single, whatever. The, the idea is so simple. To have faith to, is to walk on air. It's, it's to walk beautifully on the earth. It's to feel the angelic voices around you at all times. And to live like that is not a big, long journey. And you don't have to do a big, long course. You take one step. It's kind of turning the heart in a way. It's opening the heart at a certain level and allowing this sense of God to inhabit you purifying the deep heart and the deep heart the deep heart is a is a really strong and beautiful phrase i got it from oh it's in a book by by somebody an orthodox writer who is still alive he only wrote it about 10 years ago but he's a phrase the deep heart the Lord loves holy hearts, deep hearts, and all the blameless persons are acceptable to him. My heart is ready, O oh God, my heart is ready. I will sing and give praise. And all that sense too of giving praise and singing in your heart. So I wanted to do this because Ash Wednesday is coming and because I thought the next few weeks I will I will do a little bit of this encouraging, a little bit of um, can I say to people, let's wake up. You know, all is not lost. There is a great continuation of this God revealing himself in the world. It's still going on. And we'll go on for a long time to come. So, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead and and be alive. And it's not rocket science and it's not a big course I'm inviting you on. I'm not inviting you on a, you know, ten steps of a big long course. I'm saying it's one single step in your life and that is find private spaces. Go into the room in your heart and allow God to get in there. Give it fully and completely to the mystery of the present moment. And that will always do it for you. Just be in the present moment. Take a few seconds to be in the present moment. Just breathe, be aware of your body, be aware of the, the environment around you, and just be there present. And that's it. All done, all done and dusted, it's over. And you'll feel this sense of God's presence coming to you the more you do that. And that will become like an oasis in your day from morning to night, whatever the space is between you doing it once and then doing it a second time, or you take a few minutes and just recollect yourself and be present in the moment. It's like an oasis. Okay. I'm doing it because, because it's Ash Wednesday coming up. I'm also doing it because I feel enthusiastic about sharing with you the sense that it is so simple as a psychotherapy. Prayer is so simple as a psychotherapy and there's nobody, there really is nobody with a stick telling you that, you know, you should do this or you should do that. You have to swallow these rules or you have to obey this rule. It's not like that. This is an intimate relationship between you and God who is within you. It is opening up what is within you to what is even deeper within you. So in order to do this, I made a tape, I made a, a podcast for today, 
which is about two things. It's about the, the word God and it's about the word prayer. And I kind of worked at it to sort of get across some of the enormous, enormous ideas about God prayer. To take it out of the normal way when we are thinking about God and when we're thinking about God being just a word, just a dead word, and then we think of it like he's this God who is somewhere in the universe floating around. We think of God within the context of our own universe, rather than thinking that the word God is trying to reflect a philosophical possibility of what is beyond existence. So, here I am now finishing what is the preparatory words, and in a few seconds I will let you listen to the meditation that I have been making and working on through the week about God. I hope you enjoy it, and thank you for being here. I won't say bye-bye, because in a few seconds there's a 35-minute meditation going to begin. Thank you. I feel I'm not saying enough. It's impossible to share what you really feel. Firstly, the word God is so... It just doesn't work. I mean, the word God, by naming it, by saying the word God, you're not really getting at what. Not what, what's behind the word, but what's inside you in relation to God. There's, an, there's a notion in, in the Christian tradition that God is incarnate. That's what they say about Jesus. The incarnate God is the full, complete presence of God in this birth and life and death. And what's really important is to see the big arc. You'll get it in people like Maximus the Confessor, an Orthodox theologian of the 7th or 8th century. In this notion that um, the full purpose of the Godhead in relation to this creation is theosis, is absorption of all life cosmically into God. And so the birth of Jesus Christ is like the presence of God fully and completely with us so that Christ is what will come Christ will come back but it's like it's like just that Christ is the end point of history and the beginning is the beginning the complete full beginning God wishing expressing speaking the world into the cosmos into existence that's the ark Creation is completed in Christ, not in Adam. Adam was, in some mysterious way, a moving away from God, a rejection of God. And Christ redeems that. But that's not the big plan. The big plan from the beginning is God speaking the universe, the cosmos, into existence in order to fill it with his love. So he creates something outside himself. He creates the cosmos. But that's a job that doesn't end on the seventh day. It ends in Christ. Every single being united in Christ is able to access what they call theosis, the journey of being absorbed into God. It's kind of very close to a Buddhist idea, except that it's more personal or something. But it's, it's about that big arc that we forget about. But we're not talking about Christianity unless we're talking about the cosmic singularity at the end of time that is already present in the beginning because it's outside time. And that being that the Christ. What do we mean by Christ? It's, it, it's the one that, that holds together both God and cosmic reality or human history. Think of the relationship between God and humans. This idea of God the Father, the reason we use it is 
is that it expresses the relationship between God and and the cosmos, the creation, including humans, but it also including animals and trees and the oceans and the fish and the stars and whatever other galaxies and cos universes, multiverses there are. Everything that is uttered is uttered from some source. And the relationship between the Godhead and the creation is both intimate and remote. It's like it's like saying that when I look out on the trees and outside the window, it's no matter that I know all the stuff about how the tree grows, it nonetheless its dareness, its reality is uttered by God. It's like the fingerprint of God and the lake and the mountain. It, it, the whole thing is so intimately expressing God's presence. And it's intimate. And yet, if I ask, well, what do I mean by the word God? I mean like, like beyond everything. Transcendent to the ultimate degree of transcendence. Something that is completely the opposite and is also within. And if you go back and think about when there was no real scientific awareness about gestation and pregnancy and so forth, a mother was was seen a very powerful person, very mysteriously nurturing this baby, that a baby would grow inside her womb and then be nursed on her breast, and it was sort of fairly clear then that that person had a relationship with the mother that was physical, that was, you know, you could see the link. But the father, you would know he was the father, but the link is like there and yet not there. I stand beside my child and there is, is no physical trace of how I fathered that child. It's quite, it looks quite mysterious. Even, even now when we know all the science of procreation and, and all the details of the sperm and the egg and the, the way everything happens in sex and then in pregnancy, but even still, the sense of the father who stands behind the, beside the child is like you can't just get a link in the same way as you can with a mother because you can say, well, look, that's, that's how the child was born, out of her. The father is different. And that's why the father is such an obvious way to speak of God. It's nothing to do with male or female. It's nothing to do with male or female. Or that God is masculine. But it's, it's to do with the relationship expressing the remoteness. You know, God is not just within our time, space and cosmic matter. He's not in here in the room doing things to us. Making children. It's fundamentally different. God is so fundamentally different from our time, space, and matter, that you could say that God doesn't exist. You could actually say that the beginning of trying to accept a relationship with God is that he doesn't exist. He doesn't exist in the normal sense of existence within, within time and space and matter. God is that which is outside all that. And that's why the Father becomes a kind of a, a happy kind of way to describe because not only is it remote, but it also is completely intimate because, because anybody could see the child growing up and they'd see the father's face in the child's face. They'd say, this child is an image of the father. We are in the image of the father. The image of God. When it comes to a femininity, there are loads of places in the, in the Bible that talk about you know, God like a mother hen. The, the care and love of God is always talked about in terms of maternal love. And there's a great person 
that I often talk about in relation to that is Julian of Norwich. She talks a lot about the motherliness of God and it's a very beautiful thing to reflect on. But to get the full dimension of God's transcendence, God's otherness, God's inability to be caught within the trap of time or space or existence or or matter that we live in, this thing we call cosmic reality, to to understand that, that when we talk about God, we're not talking about some ghost flying around within the context of the universe or at the same dimension as the universe, but but as ontologically different, fundamentally like in a different dimension than time or than space or than matter. So there's no trace to be found of him in this life. And that is close to the idea of fatherhood because it also carries with it the intimacy bone of my bone. The child is the same as me. The child reflects me. Male and female, he made them in his image and likeness. Male and female. So I I think that the way that the faith works for me is always, it's always like at this personal level in the experience of faith. And for the rest of the time, I live in a world where it is as if God didn't exist. And all I can say is that I go out into that world and I enjoy it and and I keep my religion to myself. And I wonder, maybe will that be the future, you know, that, that religion becomes something you cherish more and more as a private space, an exclusive space. So I get a real, I can get a joy when I I think about speaking on a podcast because it always feels like it's one-to-one. It always feels like I'm sharing with you my private space. It's not something I'd share if I was writing a book or if I was writing a column. Now, I think there's more to it than that. I think there's more to faith. And I think the more is in the expression of it. So, you know, there's a way, there's a way that you become what you say. And there's a way that my mind can be very, very confused sometimes, and my emotions can be all over the place. And if I then say a prayer, whether it be a Christian prayer or an Islamic prayer, in fact, recently I've been, I've been trying, I've been practicing just the very first verse of the Quran, the, the first Sunnah, the Fatiha. And it's just like two sentences. And I read it in English and then I kind of tried to learn the Arabic sound for the first sentence. It's just like four words. And I would say these words as a prayer. It's the kind of thing that I'm told by my teacher that they they do. Islam and pray like a little prayer before you start anything. The Fatiha, it's the, the first sunnah or the first verse in the Quran. You can look it up. Start the day with it, start a meeting with it, say it before your dinner, say it before you get into the car. You know, it kind of is like a mantra. Again, it's like remembering you're in, in the presence of the mysterious Father God. So I was trying that, uh, and there's loads of Christian ones, you know, prayers, there's any amount of them. But if I'm confused, if I'm in a, a state of, despondency or a state of just confusion or just like you know the way you're in the, a room sometimes unfocused and you can't seem to do anything right you can't you know I can't do me work I can't write me column I can't write me book it's, it's like I'm just all unfocused and the room is untidy and yet I'm too lazy to clean it up or I I, I can't seem to have the ability to clean it up it's amazing it's amazing how I have to say I find myself sometimes 
I find myself like almost disabled by emotions. Like I'm an ordinary person and I suspect it's true for, for everybody. We don't talk about it. That there are days when we're functioning fierce well. We're functioning like at our work and, and socially and privately. And there's probably other days all of us are simply not functioning. And I think that's a time to lie down and relax and take it easy. And don't worry. You're not functioning, it's not a problem. But in those situations, I say a prayer. I know that at the end of the prayer, I am like a different person. I inhabit a different consciousness, or, or my, own, my consciousness has shifted. It just accidentally happens to be six o'clock. You'd be fierce tempted to say the Angelus, wouldn't you? I'm not going to. But but the Angelus now is a really interesting prayer. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary. And she conceived of the Holy Spirit. And then you turn your mind and heart to Mary as 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 a kind of an elevated mother of God, queen of heaven, who envelops you and envelops the entire cosmos. And you say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. It's like you're talking to somebody else. Now I'm here talking to you, and you're not here in the room with me at the same time, but I still do feel I'm talking to you. The same is true for Mary. Or a saint. And you can intellectualize about that for the rest of your life. But if you don't do it, you won't know what I'm talking about. If you do it, if you step over that simple threshold that uses some formula, whether it be from the Quran or whether it be from your own Christian memories or background, you say something like, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. You just say that. You've entered You've entered a conversation in the same way as if you were an actor, and if you were an actor rehearsing a play and you were you were rehearsing your lines on your own. So you'd be saying the words as if to the other person. But once you actually say the words, once you're once you embody the content of the words, it seems to conjure up whoever is the object of the sentence, of who you're addressing. My words to you tend to conjure you up in this room, and I, I tend to be aware of you as being present. And in the same way, if I say a prayer that is using the second person to speak to the Godhead or some aspect of the divinity or some mentor deity within the Buddhist tradition or the Jewish or the Muslim tradition, if I do this, if I actually say the words, if I perform the prayer, would be a good way of putting it because we live at a time where it's very trendy to think about all reality being performance or as they say performative so so if in the postmodern culture we think about you know consciousness identity as being performative and particularly identity being performative then well prayer is performative and it reinforces a sense of identity that you are in relationship with your mentor deity, your God. And that dynamic may reflect some profound truth, or it may just reflect no profound truth, but, but it definitely changes you as a human being. You don't have to believe in God, I think, for this. All you have to do is say, I'll perform these words as if there was a God. And in some way, it alters your consciousness, 
your attitude to the world you're living in. So I, I was going to read you a little bit from a column that is precious to me, and I think that it, it has something in it that connects with this in a, in a lateral way. Well, I was enjoying a coffee in a restaurant in Carrigan Shannon a couple of weeks ago, it's before Christmas, when two women sat down beside me. One was young and pregnant, clearly exhausted by the endless trips and around shops to find things for Christmas, and the elder was clearly her mammy. Do you mind, the elder said, if we sit here? We just need to take the weight off our feet for a minute. The young woman was devouring a big sponge bun full of cream, which she had purchased at the till while the older woman inquired if I knew where Woody's was. It's beside Tesco's, I said, but she looked blank and the younger one was too engaged with the cream bun to be bothered. You can't miss it, says I, if you go out the Dublin Road. We're from up near Corla, the mammy explained, implying that she didn't venture often into places as sophisticated as Carrigan Shannon with all its coloured lights. For all I knew, the young woman may have held a PhD in nuclear physics from the University of Limerick, but when an elder mammy brings her daughter shopping, it's really the daughter who is bringing the mammy shopping. So she must allow the matriarch to call the shots whatever way she wants. The putative nuclear physicist might well have known where every Woody's in Ireland was, but she had more preoccupying issues at that moment. After devouring all traces of cream and crumb on her plate, she left us to find a bathroom. We're going to plant a little oak tree for the child, the elder mammy whispered confidentially. I confessed that I loved trees and agreed that it was a huge wisdom to mark important occasions by planting one. Ten years ago this November, I planted a willow. I was struggling with depression, and I went at the ground with a spade all afternoon until the slender sapling was firmly established. Although as the light faded, I could barely find the trowel in the darkness. I wiped tears from my eyes, even though I didn't know I was crying. I cried as people do when they are engulfed by depression. Crying in such moments is a release of tension and the tears were a kind of balm to me, a reassurance that beneath my frozen anxieties there was a sap of tenderness, a hidden joy beneath the sorrow. The moment remains forever present in the trees that grow around me now. Every summer the willow stretches its branches towards the sun, and I can mark how much happier I have become as the years passed. Although I never forget the thin ice that lies beneath my feet and the fathomless anxieties lurking below the ice. The willow tree holds the moment. Trees hold other moments too. Times when friends arrived with potted plants at birthday parties or when a child rejoiced in some little academic victory in primary school. And I cherished the beech trees that arrived in a plastic bag through the post many years ago, from a friend who has long since passed away. Trees hold all my memories, and they gather around me in old age like friends, assuring me that the universe is beautiful. They keep me close, in the remembrance of things, and they sustain in me gratitude for things present. Maybe that's why I suspect 
I will never leave the hills above Loch Allen because I could never uproot the trees or live without them. Like my good or bad deeds, they have consequences and they unfold as they must. Of course, I didn't share any of this with the two women who were shopping for Christmas on the bright streets of Carrick and Shannon. But I hope that the years reaching ahead of them are full of love and sponge cake and unruly trees. I can't get enough of those sponges, the young woman said, smiling as she tapped her stomach. The baby must have a sweet tooth. And I hope you find a tree, I said as we parted. Later I too went off to Woody's to find LED lights for our Christmas tree. Although our tree lives in the garden near the window so we can look out at it every year and remember other Christmas Eves. And I find it comforting to imagine a mother in some far distant future looking out on a tree growing in the hills above Corla and saying to someone she loves, Did I ever tell you about the day we planted it? Me and your granny? Yeah, so you plant the tree. You're going to have a baby, and you plant this tree around the same time, and then many years later, maybe the young baby has grown up and is a little boy or girl or a teenager, and you're there with them all those years later, and you say, I remember when we planted this tree. And it's as if the moment of planting the tree is still present. And we all get that sense. If there is a ritual or a symbol we use, it might be sometimes it's going to the grave. Sometimes it's going to a church, but other times it's like planting a tree or it could be going out to a particular McDonald's that is your ritual to remember some special moment with somebody else. Sometimes it comes accidentally, you know, I'm walking along a road or a street, let's say in Dublin, that I haven't been on for a long time and it suddenly dawns on me I haven't been there for 30, 40 years, and what happened to me on that road comes back and is present to me as if it was just happening at that moment. So, so the past comes back to us all the time, but when we do something like plant a tree as a symbol, we're invoking the past to be ever-present with us. And I have trees in the garden from different people and commemorating different moments. And if I look and sit under one of those trees, I can experience the taste of that moment so long ago, and yet I can still experience the taste of it. And that's the way symbols work. And that's the way trees are very powerful because they have this sense that from a little acorn you grow a huge oak and it grows and grows, it's bigger and bigger and bigger and it's beautiful. And yet it's still... It's like it has a memory. It's like the tree has a memory and by planting it in some way to commemorate something, it's almost like you're, you're giving the memory over to the tree. And the tree then embodies this memory. But the memory, when it comes back into my mind, it is relived as if it is present. And that, to me, is the best example or illustration I can make about how faith works, that this sense of the Godhead who is present in Christ, that's the ultimate end point of all creation, theosis, that we we become absorbed into the awakening cosmos, which is awakening with the presence of Christ. That's fully there, completely already, in Christ. And so that Christ we talk about is outside time, he is the beginning and the end, the Alpha, the Omega. Everything in creation is rushing towards the completion of its consciousness in the consciousness of Christ. And the consciousness of Christ is to say, 
fully 100% completely human, fully 100% completely God. So this sense of, of prayer is like the ritual, it's like the symbol, it's like the practice that conjures up as powerfully as a tree. Okay, like a tree is gonna, it's going to die in 150 or 200 years. But in our lifetime, when we plant a tree to remember something, we can get the sense that what happened is outside time and is still present to us. And that's what I get when I say the smallest, tiniest little prayer, whether it be Islamic or Jewish or Christian or Buddhist. There's so many rich, rich prayers in Buddhism that I would use. And they alter my consciousness and bring me into the presence of God exactly the same way as a tree does and the tree brings me into the presence, let's say, of an old friend who gave me that as a little sapling and I, I planted it or they gave it to me as a wedding present and they may have passed on themselves now. I look at that tree or I'm pruning that tree and I am, it's like it brings that moment forever back into the present. That's how a tree works. When you use it symbolically to remember somebody, the other person's presence will always be there. What I'm saying is that a prayer, the tiniest little prayer, the tiniest little prayer, using the second person singular, so you're addressing the Godhead or the mentor deity as if they were there, as if they were there in front of you. And when you do that, it's like you've planted a tree. You awaken the eternal mentor deity. You awaken the Godhead to become present and to pay you attention. This is the Father God, the one who is who's so remote from the universe that you can think of the universe without God, completely. Same as ways you can think about a child without the Father, until you realize that in some sense the child is the spit of the Father, is the image of the Father. And then you think the cosmos is the image of God. That's why we say Father, because he's so unobvious, so remote, and yet so completely loving that this cosmos is in itself the spit of the Father, the reflection, the mirror of God. And that in his whole purpose, there was only one single trajectory to get from A to B, was to get to theosis, to the union of all cosmic matter in God, with God, through God. That has already happened in Christ. A, mo a moment in the crosshairs of history, time, matter, existence, but which in itself, in its ultimate source of being, transcends all history, all time, all existence. So it's the penetration of existence, this strange moment, the Christ event. And that's our tree, that's our symbol, that's our focus, that's our center. You say one little prayer and you awaken the Godhead, which is an extraordinary thing to be thinking about. It's a wonderful thing to be thinking about. So relaxing, empowering and very romantic kind of loving way to be thinking about about the cosmos but also ecologically about the planet it's so much better to be in love with the planet than to be thinking and worrying about the planet if we need to do things like plant more trees and be more loving and caring so that we're not pouring poisons and petrol and oil all over the place and destroying everything if we need to be more like a husband to this beautiful Mother Earth, then it's easier to do it the more we feel we're in love with the planet, in love with the entire cosmos as, as like it's the surface manifestation of the hidden God. Do you know something? I didn't expect this to be the podcast for this week. And more and more that happens with the podcast because I know that there have been spontaneous that I have no cover. I have no protection from what I'm saying to you. It's just like we're sharing this moment. 
and thank you, thank you for being here.